taking notes this morning, I usually like to stay in between one and three points. And so this morning, uh, we have three points. Point number one is the judgment seat of Christ. In our last study, two weeks ago, the last verse that we looked at was verse 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And Paul wrote and said this, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present, means here on this earth, or absent, uh, away from this earth, to be well-pleasing to Him. Whether we're here or gone, we want to be pleasing to the Lord. And what a noble thing that is to say as a Christian man or a woman, I want to live my life wherever I'm at for the glory of God. Now that phrase, well-pleasing, I don't think was there accidentally. I don't think Paul used that accidentally. That phrase, well-pleased, is something that is very reminiscent of a father saying something about his son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah, well pleased. The heavenly father looked down upon his son, Jesus Christ, and said, this is my son and he's well pleasing to me. So Paul's writing here that while he's on this earth, his whole desire is to be pleasing to the Lord. See, Paul was God's ambassador. Paul was a soldier, if you will, for the Lord. I think of what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. He said, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. No one that is a soldier allows the business of civilian life to interfere with his mission. In Timothy, Paul says, entangles himself. You know what else entangles? Weeds. Weeds entangle. In the parable of the sower, Jesus explained a spiritual truth by using the example of a farmer sowing seed. And that seed fell, as you remember, on different types of ground. Some fell on the wayside and the birds of the air came and plucked it up. Some fell on stony ground and it sprouted up right away, but it had no depth in which it could grow. Some fell among thorny, uh, among thorn, uh, among thorns on thorny ground and the thorns choked out what was supposed to be a living plant. Some fell on good ground and it bore much fruit. In Matthew 13, 22, Jesus explained, He said, Now he who received the seed among the thorns, the seed that fell among the thorny ground, it's, it, it is he who hears the word. They hear the gospel. And listen to what Jesus says. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. When we allow, as Christians, the things of the world to entangle us, it restricts our potential to experience the plans that the Lord has for our lives. It stunts our spiritual growth. It hinders us from becoming who God has created us to be. It literally causes us to shrivel back, to become weak, and really to become distracted by the things to the point that we lose focus on what truly is important. Jesus called it the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, those things that choke back the life of the believer. Paul said that it was the affairs of this life. See, there's so many things that are vying for our attention and our time and really the, the top of our priority list that often Christians become stunted in their spiritual growth. See, when you're in a battle, you can't be messing around for your life could be in jeopardy. When it's life and death, you don't have the luxury of goofing off. One wrong move could cost you dearly. I wish that more Christians would take a more serious approach to following Jesus when it involves compromising in sin. Entangling ourselves with the cares of this world so that we're choked out and really never become who God intended us to be. And it's such a sad thing. When people are in this place of restriction, when it comes to spiritual growth. See, weeds, they siphon the life off of living plants. They steal the nutrients that a plant needs to survive and they use it for its own survival. This is why we don't like weeds in our flower beds. Because weeds will steal what the plant needs in order to live. Weeds kill our plants by starving them of their food. See, the same applies for the Christian entangled with the affairs of this life, the cares of this world, 
and the deceitfulness of riches. And if you're here this morning, and maybe at one point you've said, you know, I profess Christianity, I, prefer, I profess faith in Christ, but then you walked away from the Lord. You allowed the things of this world to influence you. You can now look back on your life and say, this and what God's Word says is absolutely true. I've been in a restricted state. I've had the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the affairs of this life. They've choked me out spiritually. I become weak. That's why Paul again, 2 Timothy 2.4, he said, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And again in verse 9, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Upon reading this, I've asked this question because I wanted to know more fully about what Paul was saying. Why is it so important that I live my short life on this earth so well-pleasing to the Lord? Why is that so important? I mean, why can't I have some time to do some things in this world and to, to give in to the flesh a little bit? I mean, you know, what's wrong with that? I mean, I don't want to be too hardcore or too extreme. Why can't I have some fun too? Or whatever it may be that you're wrestling with. Well, I'm glad you asked the question why it's so important to live a life well-pleasing to the Lord. Because Paul answers that question in verse 10. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. This is why we must live a life to the best of our abilities to be pleasing to the Lord because we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I don't think we really understand how serious that is. Now, just by a show of hands, how many of you have ever had to appear in court for something? Right. Now, I'm not going to ask you why you were there, but we've been there. Even if it's fighting a traffic ticket, standing before a local judge is nerve-wracking. There you are in a small court, dealing with maybe small things, it's just not pleasant going to the courtroom. There's just the seriousness when you walk in. People aren't laughing and goofing around. They're usually sitting there ready to face the music. you got to walk in and stand before the judge and there's other people watching or other people waiting in the back. And then it's public and you have to you know, speak loudly or, or communicate something. It's not a pleasant thing to be involved with. Now imagine, if you will, standing before the judge of all the universes, the judge, the almighty God, the creator, standing before him to give an account for your actions. I thought about that. I'm going to stand before God and give an account for my actions. And I thought nervous doesn't even begin to describe it. That judgment seat, that phrase is actually one word in the Greek language, and it's the bima. Maybe you've heard of the bima seat. The bima was that raised step, the place that the Roman magistrate sat upon to judge a matter. And that seat itself was revered and even feared by the people. They knew what that seat stood for. We will be judged for the things that we have done. Now listen to what I'm about to say very carefully. It's been said that there are those that could have a saved soul, but a wasted life. A saved soul, but a wasted life. See, the things that you do for the Lord will be rewarded. And that should encourage you as you're there in children's ministry. As you're there setting up or tearing down the equipment. As you're doing whatever it is that the Lord has called you to do. I don't want to waste my life. I don't want to look back and say to myself that I should have given a better effort. Because you know we're all going to have regrets. And we're all going to have things that we wish we would have done differently. And I am determined that, I, I am determined that one of those regrets is not going to be I wish I would have done more for the Lord, or that I would have lived more holy, or that I would have given a better effort. Those are the things that we need to focus upon. Also, I personally find encouragement that the difficulties that I may face for the sake of the ministry or for the gospel, or the ministry really that the Lord has called me to, 
is well known to the Lord. Even as what God has called you to do and the things that you experience, it's well known to the Lord. It may not be well known to others, and I'm not doing, and I don't think you're doing what you need to do so that others will notice. See, I know that I will give an account for my actions as well as my motives. The things that I have done and the reason behind me doing them. In verse 10 again, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Huh. Whether good or bad. In verse 11, Paul says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We are well known, but we are well known to God and I also trust are well known in your consciences. Now, I don't know everything, I know a few things, and one thing that I do know is that I do not want to be a recipient of the terror of the Lord. That is not on my list of things that I want to experience ever. I want, however, to be well-pleasing to the Lord. See, apart from faith in Jesus, you're a target for receiving the terror of the Lord. You have never been removed from the place where the judgment of God will be poured out. See, your sin... Your rejection of salvation has left you vulnerable to receiving the judgment of the Lord upon all that is evil. Us saying that our good works will shield us from the judgment of the Lord, the terror of the Lord, is like saying that our t-shirt will protect us from a speeding bullet. Often people will talk of God's love, oh, God loves you, etc. Oh, God loves you, man, oh, Jesus loves you, or whatever. And that's why people, and maybe even some of you that are here today, are like, yeah, yeah, you know, I've heard a million times, Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. But they don't realize how God's love is demonstrated and how great a love that it is. See, we're born with a sinful nature, with a propensity to sin, separated from God by our sin. Our sin leads to death, to judgment, and an eternal separation from God in hell. See, the terror of the Lord will be brought swiftly upon the earth, and those that have rejected the gift of salvation. This is a serious thing. Because there are none in and of themselves that are righteous, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God's holy standards. So the playing field is level. We've all fallen short of God's perfect righteousness. And the terror of the Lord and the judgment of the Lord is coming upon those that are in sin. This is a big deal. Why am I saying this? Why is this so hardcore for you to be listening to today? Well, number one, it's the truth. But number two, it actually substantiates somebody saying how much God loves you. What do you mean God loves me? The terror of the Lord is going to show me how much God loves me? No. See, God demonstrated His own love towards you and that while you were a sinner, Christ died on the cross for you to remove you from the place of judgment. That's how God shows you that He loves you. It's not like, hey man, God loves you. It's actually, you deserve to die for your sin. I deserve to pay the price for my sin. That's the reality. And God showed Garrett how much he loved him because while I was a sinner, Christ paid the price for my sins. This is how He demonstrates His love for you. It's not just, hey, I love you, man. He backs it up with what He did. This is the truth of the gospel. We deserve the terror of the Lord, but God made a way for forgiveness to be possible. So when someone says God loves you, He showed you His love that through faith in Jesus, you might be removed from being in the place of receiving the terror of the Lord. See, Paul knew about God's judgment, and that's why he sought to share the gospel. You know, yesterday... We had a couple from our church that got married, which is really, really cool. We had uh, Stephen's sister, Stephanie, and Chris McCarthy, who have both been attending our church. They got married yesterday. How cool is that? Let's give them a round of applause, guys. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great wedding. It was a great wedding, but I think that Chris has got a gift of evangelism. It really just shared the gospel and was telling people about the Lord. He wanted it to be evident in, in, the, in the message that the pastor gave. Even, even with me and in, in doing communion and sharing you know, the gospel. He, I want people to hear the gospel. And then after uh, you know, the reception was going on, shared the gospel with people. When people understand the judgment that is coming upon the earth, 
They're emboldened to share the gospel with people. When you've experienced the goodness of God and how He's changed your life, you want other people to experience that as well. He knew. Paul knew the bad that was ahead and that spurred him to help save others. Really, this should serve as a call to holiness for all Christians. And a call to repentance for all of those that are on target to receive the terror of the Lord. Believe me, you do not want that. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus personally as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you at the end of our service today an opportunity to receive Jesus. If you're here and you've walked away from the Lord, you're going to have an opportunity to come back to Him. No longer be choked out by the things of this world. The lies of of the enemy. So point number one is the judgment seat of Christ. Point number two now as we head into verse 12 is the love of Christ. In verse 12, Paul says, For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. People in general like to keep up their appearances. You know, we all have certain standards that uh, we don't like to, let's just say, we don't like to dip below. You know, when it comes to how we may dress going outside of the house. You know, uh, no, I can't can't look like that or whatever. Uh, Some have problems in their marriages. Some are struggling. But they keep up the appearance that everything is okay, maybe for their kids' sake or for their friends' sake. Some have personal problems, but maintain the appearance that their life is all together. They're holding it all together. Now, the the point is not whether or not we should do these things. The point is that humans do these things. We we keep up appearances for appearance sake. That's why you'll have people in the church that maintain appearance, an appearance of holiness around their Christian friends or when they're at church, but completely deny that profession when they don't quote-unquote need to be holy. In 2 Corinthians, actually 2 Timothy, we're in 2 Corinthians, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, Paul said about these people, it says, They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul told Timothy from such people, stay away. See, there are those that have a semblance of godliness, but they deny the power of the Holy Spirit by giving into the lust of the flesh or just by never repenting from their sin. They just never turn. They might profess Christianity, but they never repent from their sinful lifestyles. They're entangled. And they're tripped up. You know, they may even overcompensate on Instagram about how amazing so-and-so is because they're really having a hard time with that so-and-so. There's a dangerous inflation, I think, in the church as well. What do I mean by that? Well, I think that the numbers in church generally are inflated with people that go to church but deny the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. This is a sad thing, but this is a reality. They're not transformed. They're not renewed in their mind. They don't repent from their sin, and they remain in the same state that they were in before their profession of faith. I mean, I was thinking about this because, you know, often when I respectfully, we pray for our leaders, but there are things that I don't agree with. And there are things that I don't think God agrees with because they contradict God's word. And some of those things are taking place, actually a lot of those things in the state of California, where it makes me really, really grieved in my spirit when I see the things that our leaders are doing that are so anti-God and that are so perverted. And I'm grieved by those things. And I I think about, you know, moving out of state, like, can we just get out of California? Maybe you've thought the same thing. The first state that pops in your mind is usually Idaho or whatever it might be, you know? And, and I, I've thought about those things. But don't worry, I don't have any plans of leaving California. We're going to start setting up a video screen, and I'll be in Coeur d'Alene on the lake, or whatever it might be. But I was thinking about this. How do you think that it's possible with all the mega, 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 mega churches we have in California that we're the most liberal state in the union? What do you think about that? We have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of quote-unquote Christians in massive churches, but we have a form of godliness and we deny its power. 
There are those that boast in keeping up their appearances, but they don't keep up their walk with their Lord that begins in their heart. Sometimes it can seem like people are just too hardcore as Christians because, man, they just want to live in sin and still be a Christian. And somebody that tries to tell you, you know, be holy as he is holy, or hey, come on, man, that's not what a Christian should be doing. They're offended by that. Because today, we have churches that tell people you can live in sin and you can still be a Christian. That we're just going to remove parts of the Bible and, 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 and we're going to adapt the Bible to fit you know, your lifestyle. This is wrong. They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. And that's why our prayer and the leadership of this church, myself included, is for you to own your relationship with the Lord, to own what the Bible says. To not just be a hearer, but to be a doer. To be challenged. To be convicted. To be encouraged. To be set on fire. To be a better man or a better woman. A better husband. A better wife. A better parent. To be somebody that's just not attending church, but is making a difference in their home. A difference in the world. This is what we want. Paul says in verse 13, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of a sound mind, it is for you. Now, if you know Paul at all from reading the New Testament, Paul lived a crazy life filled with many adventures, but also many trials. Some watching on the outside, like looking into Paul's life, may have thought that Paul was a little crazy to keep doing what he was doing with all the problems that he was having. You know, Job's wife looked at Job and said, why don't you just curse God and die? Look what you're going through. People may have looked at Paul's life and said, man, he's been stoned, he's been hunted, he's been shipwrecked, he's been beaten, all these things. What are you still doing in the ministry, man? Are you crazy? Yet Paul wasn't concerned with anything but being pleasing to the Lord. His crazy life that he lived was for God. And quite, and quite frankly, I was thinking about this. I personally would rather live a crazy life for God than a boring life for myself. That's what I want. And often, I have found that even during the craziest of times that my concern for others that flows from a life that is being lived for the Lord creates a stability even during the harshest of times. That's a personal note. You will find, if you have not yet already, that your desire to be pleasing to the Lord and to minister to others to fulfill your calling that God has on your life, from that place will flow this stability, this peace, because you're doing what God has called you to do. See, it's usually the trial or difficulty's job to hinder me from serving the Lord. It's the difficulty or trial that is meant to hinder you from serving the Lord, from fulfilling your ministry. And the enemy will hurl problems. And this guy said this, and then you feel that way. In order to stop us from ministering. In order to stop us from doing what God's called us to do. See, when you're living for the Lord and your heart is to minister to others, you will find that God will give you a sound mind even through the most mind-boggling of times. Because the Lord transcends the limitations of our own human nature, our own intellect, our own understanding, our own physical capability. See, See, this is what Paul is talking about here. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of what? Power and of love and a sound mind. We've not been given a spirit of fear by the Lord, but a spirit that gives us power. The Holy Spirit that enables us to love and grants us peace that surpasses all understanding. Yet, with all the difficulties, still one may ask, why would Paul endure so much to see people come to know Jesus personally? Well, Paul gives us an insight to that very thing, and it's found in verse 14. He says, for the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ compels us. 
Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. In verse 15, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. What spurs Paul? What keeps you going? What keeps me going? Paul says, it's the love of Christ that compels me. Now, I want you to mark this down. In the Greek language, that word that we have in English, compel, actually can be translated to, into a word that means to be held together lest it all fall to pieces. Think about that. The love of Christ holds me together lest I fall to pieces. And I find that to be absolutely true. How many times have we been able to draw upon the love that Christ has for us in a given situation and have that love hold us together? How many times have we been in a difficult situation where the Lord gives us a supernatural love for someone else and that love flowing that was in us, now flowing through us, holds it together? I remember years ago, years ago, there was a, there was a young woman that came into Calvary Costa Mesa on a Monday night who was demon-possessed. And this isn't movies. This isn't made up. This isn't, oh, you know, whatever. This is Hollywood. No, it was a real-life situation. There's some people that are even from Monday nights back then that would attest to this being true because they were in the same room. You know, this was the time where, you know, her friends brought her there and they, they said, you know, she's been having a really hard time. Come to find out she grew up in a home where her mom was a witch and they practiced... Uh, witchcraft and she grew up with it her whole life and through dr uh, drugs and other things she had opened herself up through doing seances and different things to really opening herself up to become possessed by an evil spirit and this was a terrible thing and this stuff still happens today and I remember just feeling just this this supercharged energy if you will for a for lack of a, a better way of describing it, where you were facing the opposite of what was in you, head to head. And I remember as she was convulsing and shaking all over the place, and one of our girls was, was holding her head so that she wouldn't hit her head against the stone wall as she was sitting in that chair. There were two things that could have happened. It could have been like, man, I'm freaked out, I'm getting out of here. Or the other thing, which somehow... I felt the love of Christ come upon me for this person because she was his daughter and she was under the control of the evil one. Do you remember that scripture that perfect love casts away all fear? I never understood that verse like I did that day. When your son is in the street playing and he doesn't see this massive truck that's just barreling down the road, you're not thinking about how you might get hit by the car. You're thinking, my love for my son means I'm going to go out there and grab him out of the street and save him. Because your love is driving away all fear. And the supernatural love of Christ that comes upon an individual is something that removes fear from the equation. And so when dealing with that girl there on Monday nights, I felt that the Lord brought her there because he loved her so much and Jesus said whom the son sets free is free indeed and we were able by the power of the Holy Spirit pray for her and see her set free and receive Jesus as her Lord and Savior and the details of that are for another time the point is is that the Holy Spirit working in the life of the believer holds the situation together through the love of Christ when I'm discouraged, maybe because of a failure, the love of Christ reminds me that I'm forgiven. When I'm feeling weak because of my limitations, the love of Christ strengthens me. As a Christian, I identify with the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus paid the price for all sin, then the price for all sin is paid. He died that we might live. But not only that, that we should have, not only that we should just have an existence, man, I got my ticket punched, but that we should no longer live for ourselves, but for Jesus who died for us. It says here, verse 14, the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. 
Jesus took our place. And he died for all that those who live now should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Yet, not all men are saved. Though there is enough forgiveness for everyone, not everyone receives it. Not everyone puts their faith in, believes in Jesus. In John 1 verse 12, the disciple John wrote and said, But as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in His name. See, some will teach this, I call it a theory. It's actually false doctrine. It's called universalism. That all men will be saved, regardless if you accepted Jesus or not. That is a false doctrine. But you hear, you hear about it just kind of making its rounds in different areas. Like if you're a good Buddhist or if you're a good Muslim, if you're a good whatever, a good Hindu, whatever it might be, if you're a good person, then God will honor that. No, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Some people might say that's narrow. How are you Christians so narrow? Listen, I didn't come up with that. If you have a problem with that, you have to take it up with God because he's the one that said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The church didn't come up with that. Jesus came up with that. And that's something that we need to be truthful and loving about. But the love of Christ compels us. It holds us together. And then Paul says now in verse 16, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. This is a massive statement. This is a mature statement. Regarding no one according to the flesh means that Paul is now regarding those who are saved in the spiritual sense, such as the things we've already covered in this book. I just want to highlight these things for you real quick. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, he says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. This is a spiritual place. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, he says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 12, For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, listen to this, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. What is he saying here? He's saying we don't regard people to what they look like anymore. We look in the spiritual. We see things through a spiritual lens. Even though, he says in verse 16, we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him thus no longer. Verse 16 here, like I mentioned, is a very mature view. It's hard not to view people in their fallen state because you see them every day. They make mistakes, and you're one of those. Seeing past those things, seeing, okay, you know what, this person has faith in Jesus, and the Lord has prepared a place for them, and the Lord is working in them, and the Lord is going to be glorified through them, it's very, very difficult. This is a very special place for us to even be viewing each other, giving grace to each other, being compassionate. Like Steve said last week, being an encourager, receiving encouragement, and encouraging others. But even here at the end of verse 16, he says, For even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, which is very interesting in the entire New Testament, because from this verse, we can speculate that Paul probably knew Jesus personally, which is very interesting. Possibly had heard him or seen one of his many miracles. Jesus told his disciples that it was to their advantage that he went to the Father because he was going to send the Holy Spirit. So Paul is saying here, even though we may have known him personally and there are those that were alive at that time, they don't know him that way any longer. Paul understood things from the spiritual realm and understood the work of the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going to send you the Helper. Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go to my Father. He's going to send you the Holy Spirit. So he says, I regard people to who they are in Christ, not who they were before Christ, or how they can act sometimes unlike Christ. And he was able to do that because of the powerful truth found now in verse 17 with our third and final point, the new creation in Christ. Paul writes and says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Yes, we have read that correctly. Anyone that is in Christ 
is a new creation, period. Being a new creation means that God takes your life and makes something new out of it. A new man, a new, mo- a new woman. See, you move past your past. Your sins are remembered no more. Your past stays in the past. The terror of the Lord is removed from you. All things have become new. So your life on this earth has been made new. Your life that you will live in the future now has a new destination. See, only God can create something from nothing. God is a God of order and purpose. It doesn't read here in verse 17 that those who are in Christ are a random occurrence of accidental circumstances. It says you're a new creation by the Creator. I love the fact, though, too, that it says the old things have passed away because so often our past likes to catch up with us. And Satan will use our past to condemn us and to discourage us. It it, it catches up and starts floating in in front of our face and we start being reminded of the things that we've done that were wrong and they were sinful. Yes, we've confessed those things. Yes, we've repented from those things. Yes, God has forgiven us, but they still just linger around from time to time. I love that the old things have passed away. They're dead. They're gone. That's not who I am now. It's not who you are now. You may have had a past, but you're new now. You're not who you were. And all those things are made possible by God. This is an amazing thing. You may have had an abortion. You're a new creation in Christ. You may have lost your virginity before you were married. You're a new creation in Christ. You lose your temper and hurt people. You used to do that, but you're a new creation in Christ. You used to be addicted to drugs and alcohol. You're a new creation in Christ. You used to be a self-centered jerk, but you're a new creation in Christ. You used to use people, but you're a new creation in Christ. You used to be a gang member, and now you're a new creation in Christ. You used to be dead in your trespasses and in your sins, but might I say again, You're a new creation in Christ. You used to be estranged from God, but He has reconciled you to Himself because you're a new creation in Christ. And as a new creation in Christ, it's vitally important to understand the things of the Spirit as Paul did. As I mentioned earlier, that it's been said that there are people who may have a saved soul, but a wasted life. As a new creation in Christ, it does not mean that you will not have the opportunity to live like the old person. See, God has made you new. If you put your faith in Jesus, God has made you a new creation. If you've not put your faith in Jesus, then you'll have that opportunity to become a new creation in Christ today. See, God has made you new, but you must submit to the Lord in order to live like a new creation. And this begins with repentance. Turning from your sin. And if there is one thing that I could just say is so important for the life of this church, is living a life of repentance. That if you fall into sin, that you confess it to the Lord, you ask Him to forgive you, and you move forward and you do the best that you can again when it comes back around. And this process of repentance continues by making choices each day that represent your newness in Christ, not the old man that has passed away. In verse 18, it says, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The things that Paul has been writing here are from God as he explains how God even reconciled Paul to Himself who was estranged from God because of his sin. And not only, not only does God reconcile you to himself, not only did God reconcile Paul to himself, he blessed Paul with this ministry of quote-unquote reconciliation. He gave Paul the ministry of helping to get people to a right relationship with God. In verse 19, it says, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Again, because of sin, the original state of the world was cast down into a sinful state. That sinful state was so far from where God created His creation to be. Mankind plunging deeper and deeper and deeper into depravity. 
depravity, falling further and further away from the Lord. And it was at that time that God sent His only Son, Jesus, to pay the price for the sins of the world and by so doing, remove the wall of separation that separated us from God. That was our sin. And it says in verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's for you. That's for you. How crazy is it that God is pleading with us to be reconciled to Him? Usually it's the party that committed the wrong pleading for reconciliation. Right? You know, the guy cheats on his girlfriend and, oh, please take me back. Please, I beg you. The woman cheats on her husband. Please take me back. The friend that gossiped behind your back. I'm so far, so sorry. Can we please be friends again? The employee that stole from you. Please, can I have my job back? The child that was kicked out of his house. Please, will you take me back in? God isn't the one that committed sin or done the wrong. It's you. It's me. Can you just imagine? I was thinking about this. Can you just imagine the amazing girl that you cheated on pleading with you to be back in a relationship with you? Can you imagine the person that you betrayed and lied about coming and begging you to be friends again? Can you imagine your former boss calling you after you embezzled money from him asking you to please come back and work for him? I mean, maybe you'd be thinking, I don't deserve to be taken back. I don't think they'd ever have me. I burned that bridge. Listen, we're the ones that sinned against God. We're the ones that should be pleading with God to forgive us. God, please. Please. But yet it is God who's doing so today. Paul says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to Him. This is as if though God were pleading through us. And even me sharing this verse today as if God is pleading through me in the text today, please be reconciled to God. If you've walked away, be reconciled to God. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, be reconciled to God today. In our final verse this morning, verse 21, it says, For He made Him who knew no sin. That's Jesus, who was perfect and righteous before God. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That you might become righteous before the Lord. The Father made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us. The Father laid on Jesus the sins of the world, which were my sin and your sin. And because the wages of sin is death, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, paying the price. And all of this took place that we might have the opportunity to become the righteousness before God through faith in Jesus. So Jesus took our sin and He gave you His righteousness. And we say, thank you, Lord. So today, understand the judgment seat of Christ. Understand what is happening in this world and that there are people that need Jesus. Understand the love of Christ. Understand how that compels us and it holds us together. And thirdly and finally, understand the glorious truth of the new creation in Christ. Know who you are in Christ. I hope that you understand a little more deeper today that phrase, God loves you. It's just not some token gesture. It's not some flippant thing that we say. It actually means something. And God showed you how much He loves you by dying on the cross for your sins so that you might become the righteousness of God. Would you join with me as we pray? Father, we thank You, Lord, for Your Word. And Lord, just to cut to the chase, I pray for any that may be here this morning or that may be watching this online that do not know You personally as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I ask that You would now speak to their hearts so clearly and so powerfully that they would know 
that they need to make that commitment to you to be forgiven of their sins, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be removed from the to be removed from that place of judgment and to become a new creation in Christ. And very simply, with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here today and you have never given your life to Jesus, you never have. Maybe you grew up in church, maybe you went to Sunday school, maybe you were baptized as an infant, whatever it might be, but you as an adult are sitting there right now in your seat knowing in the deepest part of your heart that you do not have a relationship with God. If that's you, then I want to give you that opportunity now to become righteous before the sight of God and to receive that gift of salvation. And if you're here this morning and you're walking with the Lord, I'm going to ask that in just the quietness of your own heart that you'd be praying for those that need to make that decision today. Not only for you that need to make that commitment to Christ for the first time, but maybe you're here today and you've walked away from the Lord. Maybe what Paul wrote to Timothy in saying certain people have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. Maybe that struck you. And the Lord convicted you and showed you that you need to recommit your life to Jesus today. Don't ignore that. Repent. Turn from your sin. Don't get choked out by the things of this world and the affairs of this life. This life is short. Be as Paul. As he said, whether I'm present or absent, I want to live my life to be well-pleasing to God. And as he went on to say, because Jesus died, we should live no longer for ourselves, but for Him who died for us. And so with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus or you're watching online and you like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be forgiven of your sins, then I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand wherever you're at and say, yes, this is me. I'd like to give my life to Jesus today. Would you hold your hand up so I can see it? Because I'm going to lead you in a, in a prayer to receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior. And also, I'm going to ask that if you're here and you maybe walked away from the Lord and you're here in church today, and you've heard these things. God loves you so much and you understand that now. And if you need to recommit your life to Jesus today, would you raise your hand as well and say, yes, that's me. I need to recommit my life to Jesus. Would you hold your hand up so I can see it? I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, I pray for these that have raised their hands, Lord, and then for those that may be watching from some other place. Lord, I thank you that you love them so much that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the price for sin, which is the wrath of God. Lord, as they all have their different experiences leading up to this point, I thank you, Lord, that you meet them exactly where they're at. And Lord, I pray that now as they pray this prayer, that you would minister to them and that you would help them, Lord. In Jesus' name, with every eye closed and head bowed, if you raised your hand, maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know that you need to give your life to Jesus or get right with Him, I'm going to ask you just to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Meet it in your heart and pray, Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you would forgive me of my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I thank You that You love me. I thank You that You sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sin. And I thank You that You have forgiven me of all of my sin. Would You fill me with Your love and Your joy and Your peace? And give me Your strength that I may be who you've created me to be. For I give control of my life to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, we thank you that you have heard these prayers. We ask now, Lord, that there would be repentance, turning from sin, pursuing holiness and righteousness. May they not forget, Lord, the truths found in your word. And we thank you, Lord, for what you have done here yet again. We give you all the glory, all the praise, in Jesus' name, amen.